This is a lesson on the wave-particle duality in a unit on modern physics. In a prior unit, I had introduced the idea that light was a particle. We had seen that with the photoelectric effect, we had seen that with atomic spectra, and we saw it with Compton scattering that photons have momentum, and photons have discrete amounts of energy. It was very natural for the physicists at the time, who were very perplexed about this particle property of light, to say, well, if there's symmetry in the cosmos, if there's some sort of elegance of symmetry in the cosmos, then particles should act like waves. Um, and that was a question that was a very high eyebrow raised question, like could that really happen? Uh, the wave particle duality says that light behaves as a wave permeating a region of space under some conditions, and it behaves as a particle of quantized energy and momentum in other conditions. So could we get matter to do this? Could we get particles to do this? It's not intuitive that a particle would act like a wave. So proving this symmetry set was a, actually kind of an interesting task, and it was done by de Broglie in the 1900s. While he was a graduate student, it was his doctoral thesis. And when he suggested it, it was a radical proposal, it wasn't getting much support, but then he sent it to Einstein, who of course was, you know, the photoelectric effect, found out that light was particles, and said, hey Einstein, do you think particles are like waves? And Einstein said not only was that probably true, but also that was a fundamental concept of the whole cosmos, that there is this symmetry. So, okay, theory set, and even you could get the mathematics behind it, but can we observe it? And it was verified through observation in 1925 by American physicists Davison and Germer, and also independently the next year by Thomson. And I provided that picture over here um, from OpenStax, that if you shoot a beam of electrons at a crystal here, you can see the crystal here, what you can get is the electrons showing interference because there's a path length difference. Fascinating that you can get electrons to interfere with themselves with the crystal lattice. So this is consistent with the predictive interference of electrons having their wavelength. They could actually do calculations and predict the measurements and it was true. Amazingly, it was true. So while they were proving this symmetry, other people were doing important work as well. Like I said with mathematics, we, they needed to get the mathematics to work. They needed the theory, the abstract theory, in order to coincide with what they were observing in real life. So Schrodinger was in there. You may be familiar with the Schrodinger equation. That's the wave equation for subatomic particles. Um, he published four papers on the wave nature of particles. Uh, treating them with wave equations. So he was actually putting mathematics to this theory. The other one was Heisenberg. You may be familiar with Heisenberg's name. Uh, he formulated mathematic treatment with matrices rather than wave equations. So mathematical treatment was coming in. And when we get mathematical treatment, we're able to make predictions as well. De Broglie's work here in say, with his doctoral thesis, which was approved, it passed, um, it was the basis for the development of all of quantum mechanics, that we can get particles to act like waves. It explained many things that were anomalous in classical theory, uh, where a particle has a distinct place in space with a distinct location. Now that it's a wave, it's doing wave things and does cannot be in a particular place. So de Broglie won the Nobel Prize along with Davison and Thompson for their observations for proving this hypothesis. So that's the history on that. Let's look a little bit at the actual physical things that happen that we can understand. Uh, so what we do is we take an electron gun, uh, an accelerator, an electron accelerator, and we accelerate electrons to very, very high energies. And then we point them at a double, double slit. It's not enough to point them at just a single slit. If they were waves and we point them at a single slit, we would see a diffraction pattern, just as we expect, okay? But the double slit pattern verifies dis very definitively that if we shoot one electron through these two slits, it has to choose a slit in some way, like in classical mechanics. 
But when we think about a wave, a wave doesn't choose one of these two slits. The wave will go through both of these slits and then interfere with itself on the other side. That's not what we expect a classical particle to do. Electrons interfering with themselves as a wave, they go through both slits at the same time and then interfere on the other side. It sounds like crazy talk, right? But when we look at the observations, we see that there is an interference pattern based on a wave prediction. We see that there's an interference pattern as if this particle were a wave, as if it were light. And these places, all of these positions and angles, were predicted as if it were light, but we're working with a particle. And so at this point, this is where people really had their mind blown, where a particle acted like a wave with this double slit experiment. So if you let this double slit experiment go over time, you can see that there's an emerging pattern. And I have this on the other side. There's 40 electrons. 200 electrons, 2,000 electrons, so we're getting magnitudes of orders going on here. And you can see that there's an intensity pattern. There's not just a single spot, like if we were throwing basketballs through a door, there'd just be a single spot on the wall where they would hit. But that's not how these electrons are acting. There's some sort of place that we, there's a probability that it could end up in one of these regions, right? It, there's some sort of probability that a single particle, when we shoot it through a double slit, could end up anywhere across the screen with some prob higher probabilities in regions than others. They also saw this with protons, with other particles. So there's the pattern for electrons. We can see it's kind of narrow. Uh, with large dark spots, we can see that this larger particle has a different pattern, interference pattern. And so there's wider bright spots, there's not as much interference leading to dark spots. And so there's a different wavelength going on. There must be a different wavelength. We know interference patterns for a double slit. D sine theta equals m lambda. If you keep D the same and you change the lambda, then you're going to get a different angle. So we see that these particles are having a different wavelength. And what we know about light is that the momentum of light is related to its wavelength. We figured this out for photons. And so de Broglie said, Einstein agreed. We have all these people saying, well, you know what? This must be true for particles as well. If a particle has momentum, then it must also have a wavelength. I'm letting that sit in for a second. You may be thinking about yourself. If I'm walking down the street, does that mean I have a wavelength? I have mass and velocity. Does that mean I have a wavelength? And I will say, yes, you could calculate it. But it's so insignificant in the context of being on the planet Earth. You're going so slow, you're not going to diffract very much at all. Okay, But as something gets going faster and faster and faster and faster, we see that they're going to have a like, that particle is going to have a likelihood to diffract. We can then relate the wavelength and the momentum of a particle, just like we did the wavelength and momentum of light. We call this the de Broglie wavelength, after de Broglie and his work and the Nobel Prize on this. And we will reiterate that matter presents the same interference characteristic as any other wave. So if you're looking at single slits, if you're looking at double slits, if you're looking at diffraction gratings, any of that, you can use the same equations that we did for light. Now you can just do it with particles. Super creepy and very true. So there's the equation. I'm also going to remind you that classical momentum for a particle is also true. You can use this uh, for small velocity. And I will say that's when v is um, smaller than, I would say, about 10% of c when you're at smaller velocities. When you get the larger than that, there's a relativistic velocity that needs to be considered. But for the most part, we can just look at mv for a particle. So uh, let me, I felt like it was appropriate to gather all the information because now we're seeing particles act like waves and, and waves act like particles, right? And so uh, wave particle quantities, I created this table for you so that we can have a little bit more of a summary of similarities and differences. Um, I'm going to remind you again, the mass of a photon. Quick quiz, mass of a photon, it's light 
light does not have mass at all. So if you're having this issue, again, if you catch yourself asking what's the mass of a photon, you should have a big red flag go up in your head. It may take you a couple of times to, to actually do it um, because I see people struggle with this, treating light as a particle and therefore it must have mass, but it does not have mass. Particles have mass and we measure it in kilograms. So uh, particles of matter definitely have mass. So that is a major difference between photons and particles of matter. The energy of photons we've covered already, HF or HC over lambda. You've used that before. That's a very um, nice and elegant equation. Particles of matter do not follow this equation. I know you're going to want to use this equation on matter, but you cannot. They're not the same. Photons don't have mass, so their energy does not is not based in mass. Particles of matter do have energy based in mass, and so that's where we're going to relate it to the kinetic energy. You cannot talk about the kinetic energy of a photon. You can only talk about kinetic energy of a particle. So the kinetic energy, we know the equation for kinetic energy, 1 half mv squared, but I'm going to remind you the more useful version, especially in this context when we're looking at momentum next, is that kinetic energy is p squared over 2m. And I'm going to show you how to use this equation in my example problem. Finally, momentum for photons and for particles of matter. Same equation, p equals h over lambda, and with the particles of matter, I can relate it to its classical momentum as well. Don't try to find mass for a photon. You cannot do it. It will not work. It's a fun game that you will lose. Photons do not have mass. So please keep that in mind while you're doing problem solving. The problem I picked is about electrons. So I'm going to remind you about like the mass of the electron. We need the mass of the electron here. It's a particle, so it has mass. Uh, there's the summary table here with all of these equations. A beam of 54 eV electrons is passed through a double slit and have their first maximum at 25 degrees. So we're thinking about double slits. We know double slits d sine theta equals m lambda, and we're looking at the first maximum, so we know m equals 1. They give us the energy of the electrons, but if we want to find the slit separation d, we can see d's here, we have the angle, we need to figure out what the wavelength is of these electrons. Okay, So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to use the wavelength of these electrons. And I know then that P equals H over lambda. But they give me the energy. So I have the kinetic energy equals 54 EVs. And like I said, I'm going to teach you, this is a more useful equation. I'm going to put P squared over 2M for that energy. So if I solve for P squared, I get 2M times the kinetic energy. And what I can insert in here is that P for the momentum for a particle is H over lambda. So I'm going to set that equal to H over lambda squared, right? P squared is this, and P squared is also this. So when I solve for lambda, I get H over the square root of 2M times that kinetic energy. So let me plug that in over here. We get Lambda equals 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34th divided by 2 times the mass, 9.109 times 10 to the negative 31st times that kinetic energy. Well, I have 54 EVs, but then I also need to multiply by 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th joules per EV, and then we'll square root that whole thing. When I solve for lambda here, I get 1.67 times 10 to the negative 10th meters. So you can see that's like 0.167 nanometers. So we have a pretty small wavelength in regard to like visible light, things we're used to shooting through a single slit, right? So let's solve for D. D equals M lambda over sine theta. So I can put that in. M equals 1. Lambda is... 1.67 times 10 to the negative 10th, and then I can divide by sine 25. And when I run this all through the calculator, I get 3.9518 times 10 to the negative 10th meters.
which at face value, you may not think much about it. But when I look at this, I'm like, that's about four angstroms. That's about the size of an atom. That's about the size of structure in crystal lattices. This is not a slit in the way that we think about slits. Okay, when we think about slits, we think of maybe a metal grating with some holes in it or something. But this is way smaller than that, so much smaller than that. This is the size of the crystal lattice that Davison and Germer worked with here. That was, that's what's going on. That's the size, the wavelength of those electrons being shot into that crystal lattice. And so very interesting kind of scale-wise and also energy-wise when you look at an electron.